That always sounds so scary. <laughs> it's like buckle your seatbelt on the plane. Yeah, something like that. If you're just joining us, thank you. We'll be starting in about two, three minutes. We're just getting set it set up. And what you might want to do is, um, if you're familiar with Zoom, you might want to turn on your participants and your chat. That way you can see the chat screen and the list of participants on the side of your uh, Zoom screen. And we will be posting a few things in the chat as we go along. Okay. And it's, it's San Luis Obispo, so people come late. That seems to be typical. I don't know if anyone else finds that to be the case. Okay. And we've got some more folks, somebody in the waiting room. Okay. Let's just wait until these folks are fully connected. And we'll be starting just a minute or two. Thanks for your patience. Hey, Susan, once I start uh, chatting, do you mind watching the um, admit thing? Let people in the room, are you able to do that? Okay. Yes. Okay. So just hit the admit. Yeah, just hit that button. You need to okay. do fairly quickly, otherwise it sticks them in a waiting room and that's a little dicey. Okay. Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started today. Um, I'm going to mute everybody just now as we start and we can uh, take questions later and do some unmuting. Uh, my name is Denise Foree, I'm a librarian at Cuesta College and I'm involved with the Book of the Year Committee. And we're very pleased today to be able to welcome the Master Gardeners uh, group from UC Extension, San Luis Obispo County, and they are going to be presenting to us today on pollinators. And uh, we're going to be taking questions more towards the end of their presentations. We were lucky to have three people presenting today, and uh, we'll be um, introducing them and hearing from them in just a moment. Um, I'm really glad that we could do this. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, last year, our book of the year, 2020, that memorable year or not so memorable year, uh, we had chosen The Honey Bus by author Meredith May, a renowned um, journalist, author, and so forth. And she was to be here in SLO um, presenting in person with a lot of these events, such as this pollinator workshop today in person and an Earth Day Fair. Well, you all know what happened in 2020, 20, the spring. So COVID hit, everything came to a crashing stop and our program was uh, canceled, delayed, whatever, like so many other parts of our lives. But anyway, we're back uh, this month with several virtual events. This is one of them. And we're pleased to, to have you here today. And before I start in uh, with our presenters, I'm gonna do a little screen share and just give you a little uh, promo information about some of our other events that we have coming up. So bear with me while I screen share. It always takes a minute. Oops. Here, I do hear sirens somewhere, so I'm going to mute a couple folks for right now. I don't know if you're near a hospital. Okay. <laughs> okay, we do have other events coming up, so I'm just going to show you our Cuesta College Library Events page. Uh, here is our main author event. Now, I will say it, it's free. Uh, you just need to sign in. If you go here to sign in right now, it'll tell you we're full, but by tonight we hope to add another 10, uh, uh, sorry, 100 seats. So just bear with us, we're adjusting that. We also have a film screening, 90 minute film. It's a great film if you haven't had a chance to see it, uh, The Biggest Little Farm. 
and that one too you need to do a sign up it's free we will also be having uh, our very popular chemistry and environmental biology faculty member greg greg baxley do a little q a uh, friday afternoon to introduce that film you need to sign up for that one as well but also free and then we have one other event i want to mention and that's tomorrow and there's no sign up that is a discussion susan and i will be there leading that and you would just go to this zoom room uh, again it's free no sign up required and susan if you want to put this events page the um web address for that in the chat now that would be great and one other thing i'm going to give you a plug for and screen share I think. Because uh, we're not charging for tickets this year, we're not, we don't have any income. So if you have any inclination, 5, 10, 20, or if you're rich more, you might consider uh, a donation to our Book of the Year Fund so that we can begin planning for next year's author and events. And again, if you go to the web address that Susan is putting in the chat here, uh, you'll be able to get all this information. Okay, any questions before we get started? Okay, without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Gary, who is going to start off. Gary Larson, again, of the UC um, Extension Master Gardeners of SLO County, and he will take it away. Thank you, Gary. Okay, Denise, uh, just a moment. Let me get mine going here. Sure. Uh, Peggy, Peggy, is that okay? Can you see my notes or? No, it looks good. Okay, good. All right. We're <laughs> Whoever would have thought gardening and Zoom skills would be used in the same sentence, but <laughs> we're so welcome and thank you for inviting us. I say us, uh, myself, Gary Lawson. I'll be followed by Karen Russo, who will be uh, focusing on native bees. And the last segment, Peggy will be focusing on uh, butterflies, as well as some odd and unusual pollinators that we don't usually think about. Uh, as Denise said, uh, if you could hold your questions until the end or put them in the chat box, and then we'll address them as we go along. Just a very quick background in terms of, uh, I am a master gardener with the SLOW program. And my area of focus with the program is I'm uh, the uh, head of the docent program for our demonstration garden, which unfortunately is not open to the public right now, but we have many events. So now we're doing it by Zoom, as well as I'm uh, the chair for the succulent garden, succulent plots. And uh, succulents actually can be used for pollinators also. In fact, uh, some of the desert species require uh, nighttime pollination by moths and bats. So let's go ahead and uh, start moving through the uh, presentation. And I'll start off with uh, an activity that is everyone's favorite, but I'll also let me turn on my uh, little annotator here, if I can spotlight, see if I can get that. Okay, so let's go to a pop quiz, everyone's favorite. Hopefully. So first slide you have, which ones are pollinators? We have a hummingbird, there's a lady beetle, a moth, a bat, a honeybee, and a butterfly. So think to yourself, you don't have to turn in your answers, which ones are pollinators? And if you guessed all of them, you would be correct. In fact, we could add uh, humans and flies to the slide, but I only had so much real estate on the slide. Uh, so today though, we're really gonna be focusing uh, on a few of the pollinators, primarily the native bees and the butterflies, and then some at the end towards all of them. But to think about pollinators uh, is actually a very broad topic. It's a very attractive topic right now, um, I don't know if COVID had anything to do with it and everyone's out in their garden, but it's a hot topic right now. So the first effort that I'm going to be focusing on is general gardening or landscaping practices uh, that will be attracting and maintaining pollinators. So let's begin with that one. I'll give you a checklist 
And before you go out and spend a lot of money, which you can easily do, and buy maybe the right plant, but the wrong place to put it, I would strongly encourage you to create an inventory of what's currently in your garden or your property or your neighborhood. Uh, and there's a couple steps in doing that. It's advised to spend a one year or four seasons to go around to see what's blooming, what are the insects, what are the pollinators uh, being attracted to. It's not just a summertime activity, but here, I don't, I'm not sure where all the attendees are today, but we're broadcasting from the central coast of California, a Mediterranean climate. We're blessed with our climate here. But a number of the pollinators actually benefit from having winter and early spring blooming, a time when it's usually raining, maybe not so much this year, but we don't think about providing food and pollination, pollination for the pollinators during the winter and early spring. So think about one year, four seasons to get some information, what's available. What are the plants that the insects are landing on? You may not know their name, but just start getting an idea. Oh, look, the bees really like the blue plants or the yellow plants to start training your eye to look to see where the pollinators are. You also may be amazed at the size of some of the native pollinators. They can be the size of a pinhead. So unless you're looking for the large butterflies, there, there could be a whole world of insects out in your garden that you need to just come up close to the plants and look around. So if you, uh, another way is uh, to get inventories to walk around your own garden or the neighborhood. I would advise that if you're gonna walk around the neighborhood with your camera and taking photos, advise your neighbors that you're doing it. Uh, they may come running out wondering what's going on. And in your inventory, plan for a bloom succession. Uh, and we'll give you some resources here in a moment to look at that around a full year's level. It's very helpful to the pollinators to have something in bloom pretty much year round. They're not all in hibernation at the same time. So moving on, after you've now created an inventory, the next piece of advice we're going to be highlighting, and I think most, most of us will be underscoring, the advantages of using native plants. Native meaning to this area uh, versus an exotic plant, as they're sometimes called. We're not saying don't use exotic, something from the eastern part of the U.S. or down the deserts, but try and get a backbone to your garden for the pollinators using native plants. Some of the advantage of using the native plants will be that they will attract four times as many bees and three times as many butterflies or moths than the non-native plants. These plants and the pollinators have co-evolved. They've gone through generations and they know what, how they both work with each other. So there's just a, uh, a bigger chance of increasing the pollinators coming around if you use the native plants. Also, the native plants will use less, if any, fertilizer. And that is actually a, a, a big deal with the, uh, using fertilizer. Um, not only that, but they'll be using less water. And here on the Central Coast, as you know, we're entering into another moderate drought. So using less water and the water uh, beds that we now have are getting contaminated. I live in South County and uh, we are finding that our wells pretty much throughout South County are all tainted, if you will, by runoff fertilizer. So over fertilizing, especially using the uh, petroleum-based fertilizers, really actually it's creating a problem. And if you're following the news right now uh, with the uh, honeybee decline, and the author may in fact speak about some of this, 
is that the studies are showing it, uh, even though we've stopped using uh, some of the nicotinoid uh, uh, into insecticides, it's the long acting systemic fertilizers that are now creating problems also. So an advantage of using the native plants is less water and less fertilizer. They'll also be much less invasive. Again, they've grown up, they've learned to live and thrive in this area. And when you're thinking about planting these native plants, a guideline would be use a four foot by four foot patch or a three by three. There's, it's not a hard science, but the concept is you want a patch of similar color and plant structure to keep the pollinators much more efficient. The science behind it would be if the pollinator is jumping from one plant to another, it's a completely different genus. I'm going to anthropomorphize, but they're thinking, oh, what is this plant? How do I get to the nectar? Where's the pollen? That is not a very efficient way of uh, gathering your food and resources. So have them in patches. And we'll, I'll show in a little bit that it, so rather than planting one single bloom and another single bloom of a different plant, very cost ineffectiveness, plant them in a patch. And a patch could be a bush or a mounding type of plant. It doesn't have to be 50 of one type of a single bloom. So using the patch uh, can be very helpful. So to help you uh, move along, now you, this is not an eye exam, so you may not be able to read this. I have uh, downloaded from the Xerces Society. You will have that on the reading list at the end. I strongly would encourage you to go to it. You can um, download a recommended list of native plants for wherever you are in the United States. This just happens to be here in California. I think we're grouped into Southern California. So this would be an example. There's lots of plant guides out there, but I wanted to show you the uh, constituent parts and why each one is important. So on the left column here, this gives you the bloom period. So this will let you get an idea. When does this plant bloom? Is it early, mid-season, late? Does it bloom during the winter? The next will be what's the common name versus the scientific name. And I would encourage you to, if you can, get the scientific or the Latin name. I'll show you why here in a moment. Is the plant an annual? Is it a perennial? Is it something that you, it, it can reseed itself like the uh, California poppies? Or is it something that's gonna be a perennial and it will die back? You don't have to worry about replanting it. What's the flower color? Different pollinators are attracted to different colors or there's a preference anyway. How tall will it be? As you structure and design your plantings, you typically want the taller plants in the black, in the back of the uh, bed, or in the very middle if you're gonna have a walk around bed. And then will your guide give you some notes as to where will this plant work? Where's the best placement of it? Even here on my, I live, as I said, in uh, east of AG, I live on the shady side of the canyon and I have microclimates on my property. Some is very shady year round. Some is very sandy. I have a lot of clay soil. So just because I live in my property doesn't mean all the plants will thrive there. Right plant, right place is a good line. So why you might want to try to recall or to know the botanical name. From this list, one of the plants that's recommended is this uh, Cleveland sage or the Salvia clevelandii. So if you went down to Miners or any other the nursery store and says, I want a sage plant because I saw that Gary Lawson said it'd be good, you may come home with this really beautiful garden sage that's more for the herbs of cooking. I think that's a beautiful plant on the right, that tricolor garden sage plant, but it ain't going to give you the blossoms that the Cleveland sage on the left is. So if your neighbor says, oh, that's a sage plant, go and get it. You may come home with an herb sage, not the one that's gonna have the uh, uh, tall, tall blue flowers. So that's why, if you can, try and get the scientific name. 
Uh, we run into this all the time in the demonstration garden. Some will have a common name, and that can be across genus, genera. So try and get that. Another caution, sparingly use double or triple petal flowers. On the left, you can see this is a single petal flower. It's a sunflower. This bee is having a great time being able to get to the nectar and the pollen. But if you look on the right, this is a sunflower. These are beautiful. These are the ones you can buy at Trader Joe's and put on your tabletop. They're gorgeous. But there's, they've been hybridized to such a level, no way can the insects get to any of the pollen or the nectar. So over hybridization has actually been a detriment to pollinators. And here's in some other examples. Denise, I see on your background, you've got a rose. You have a more of a climbing rose, but these tea roses smell great for us, but they have been hybridized, many, many of them, to the point that there are minimal pollen and nectar available to the insects. Carnation, double, triple, begonia is another one that um, they're just poor suppliers of pollen and nectar. So again, if you're planting these double and triple petal flowers, it's great, but to know that you're not going to be helping the pollinator insects. Okay, so now that you've done your inventory and you've identified which of the native plants you want, let's look at some of the pollinator friendly landscaping tips. And the first will be certainly you'll hear all of us talk about is to limit your use of pesticides. Uh, if you're going to use the Master Gardeners and uh, a and we strongly encourage a integrated pest management. So start with the least uh, toxic pesticide, such as just shaking off the insects that you have on your plant. Because if it's a systemic pesticide you're using, uh, you will be, in fact, uh, the bees and the pollinators will be eating that from the pollen and the nectar in the plant. Some of the better nurseries are now putting little stickers on their plants that says these are neonicotinoid free. They've not been given the chemicals uh, as a seedling. So limit your use of pesticides. We've talked about food. You've, you've uh, identified your plants and you made those available. The next landscaping will be to provide a source of water. On the left is a butterfly puddle station, and Peggy may talk more about this also. If you notice, it's not just water, but water with pebbles. So the uh, butterfly and the insects can actually get down near the water. And one of the big attractions here is they're actually going towards the mud and the minerals contained in the mud. So they're muddy. On the right, this is actually my entryway of my house. Um, on a really hot day, the bees will be covered <laughs> on, this, on this water fountain. It's a fish fountain, but the bees love it too. A third aspect in your landscaping will be providing a, um, a shelter. And this is a shot from our wildlife habitat plot in our demonstration garden in Slow. And if you'll notice, we have different heights of plants and that's encouraged and that's what you want, not just all the same. So I believe this back is a large, um, uh, I've lost the name of this, this is a um, California, it'll come to me in a moment, a Buckeye, no. Um, fuchsia? And, yeah, what is it? Is it a California fuchsia? A buckwheat, a buckwheat, oh, buck yeah, buckwheat. Uh, this is a um, Asclepias, I think a narrow leaf, Peggy, you can correct me. This is a butter, uh, you know, uh, milkweed. So you can see the different heights in your garden is what you're wanting to give them a sense of shelter, both from predators as well as the weather. In addition, you'll want to provide a source of nesting for them. And this can be provided in 
Uh, this is actually a bee house. You can buy those online. I bought mine at Costco. You can make your own. It's, and Karen will show you in a little while. It's a house with a lot of tubes, whether they be uh, paper straws or bamboo. The, um, uh, the de uh, nesters of the bees will go in and build their nest there. Another example would be if you choose the right plant, the pollinators will in fact nest in the stems of these plants. I am experimenting this year with this first one. This is a Joe Pye weed, and it's actually from back east. It's a, it's they like clay, wet soil, and I have a spot in my courtyard that that's what it is. It's not not the normal dry soil here. So and they get about five feet tall, and the insects love them. So I'm going to be experimenting with a Joe Pye weed this year because they have the pithy structure in the branches. Another example would be to build a log, I mean, plant a log or build a brush pile. If you can, you may live in a, uh, in a housing development that has HOA requirements and they don't allow stuff like log piles or brush piles, but you can hide one in your, the beds of your garden and the insects will overwinter. They will raise their brood in these uh, dead logs as well as uh, wood chips and fine leaves. That brings me up to my section. So Karen, uh, I will stop sharing my screen now and turn that over to you to talk about bees. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> I'm just getting to my my um, my slides. And just as a reminder, as Karen's getting ready, as we said um, when we first started, and I know some of you may have come in a little late, uh, we'll be taking questions towards the end, and you can go ahead and start typing those in the chat if you have any. And Susan, who's working with us, will kind of collect those and uh, feel free to, as I say, make a comment in the chat. Thanks. Can you see my screen yet? Yes, we see it with all your slides on the left if you want to go in. Okay. All the way to the left. It's from the get, yeah. Keep going up to your left. Keep going up. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, All the way to the left corner, Karen, for from beginning. Yep, drop down, drop down, drop down. There. Okay. All right, everybody. Sorry about the. Um, my name is Karen Russo, and I've been a UC Master Gardener class of 2016. I live in uh, San Luis Obispo, North County, Paso Robles. Um, and I love native bees. I've been learning about them for quite a few years now, and I like to share everything I know about them, and there's a lot to share. Um, I'm also part of the wildlife garden that Gary just got done finishing showing you pictures of those. Um, one thing I like about wildlife gardening is that it doesn't always have to be very neat and tidy because wildlife likes it a little bit wild. So if you don't get to some things, it's okay because native bees and other pollinators like weeds too. Uh, so let's get started. So solitary native bees are very important pollinators. They pollinate 80% of the world's flowering plants and 75% of the fruits, nuts, vegetables in the United States. Animals and insects pollinate over one third of our food. Bees pollinate 98% of vitamin C plants, 7% vitamin A plants, 
55% folic acid plants and 74% of lipid plants. There are 20,000 species worldwide, 4,000 in the United States and 1,600 in California. Approximately 75% are solitary native bees. Native bees emerge from the nest fully ready to mature. They're fully mature and ready to get busy. They, they rarely sting, but if they're trapped or stepped on, they can. And they actually can sting multiple times. They don't die when they sting. But their sting is not as strong as a honeybee. And they, they again, rarely do sting. They don't sting to guard their nest. And they don't die when they sting. Their sting is not as strong. Males cannot sting. And males are only equipped to collect nectar. But they still pollinate. Uh, they mate more than once without dying as well. They have two sets of wings for a total of four. Their antenna is used to touch, taste, and smell in two different directions. I find that pretty amazing. Um, they use their proboscis or tongue and leg sensors to taste for nectar collection. They use sunlight, landmarks, and a built-in magnetic sense as a compass for navigation. They're adaptable to cool climates and able to fly in light rain. They also use their strong mandibles for gnawing tunnels in soil or wood, cutting leaves or collecting nesting materials. Depending on the species, female bees have specialized hair on their abdomen or legs called scopae, which is used to collect pollen. Bumblebees and honeybees collect pollen in pollen baskets called curbicula on their legs. They live for approximately 40 days. These little guys are turbo pollinators. Native bees are 98% effective pollinators. Honeybees are 5 effective pollinators. For example, native bees will pollinate 12 pounds of cherries in the same amount of time it takes a honeybee to pollinate one half pound. Also, another example, Seven mason bees can pollinate one apple tree, and it takes 545 honeybees to pollinate one apple tree. Uh, the larger bees, like carpenter bees, are notorious nectar robbers because they don't quite fit inside the smaller flowers, such as salvias. In this picture, you can see. So they bite the outside base of the flower to get to the nectar. Sometimes the other bees will see this and follow along for the leftovers. Bees are equipped with five eyes. They have two compound eyes on the sides of their head, and they have three simple eyes, usually on the top of their head. They can see polarized light patterns on flowers, iridescent plants that humans cannot see, as well as ultraviolet light. The UV pattern in the flower petals dramat dramatically announce the stash of nectar and pollen and act as the landing zone guiding the bees to the reward. For example, in a calendula, they see a bullseye. And in a snapdragon, they see lines that act as a little landing strip. Most of the bees are oblivious to red, but they see orange, yellow, white, pale, and bright pink and are very attracted to pale or dark shades of purple, blue, green, blue, and ultraviolet. Native bees can't dance, but they can buzz pollinate. So larger bees, such as carpenter and bumblebees, buzz pollinate. If this picture looks a little fuzzy, it was taken when this carpenter bee was actually buzz pollinating Dutch iris there. Uh, the buzz pollination occurs when the larger bee lands on the flower, grabs onto the flower with her tarsal claws, bites its anthers, and then vibrates her flight muscles to shake the pollen loose all over her body. As you can see, it gets all over her body. So then, like the honeybee, she grooms the pollen down her legs into baskets called curbicula to carry back to her colony. The bumblebee is the most... Uh, the bumblebee, this is actually a carpenter bee, but the bumblebee is the most like the European honeybee in that they colonize and they, they produce a very small amount of honey just for their young, um, as you know, different from the honeybee. Anyway, 
So according to a study published in the Journal of Insect Behavior on April 16th, 2018, quote, over time and with practice, bees are able to tune down their vibrations, removing pollen while potentially saving energy, unquote. As estimated, 8% of the world's plant species require buzz pollination by the larger bumblebees and carpenter bees, such as these, for example, blueberries, cranberries, tomatoes, potatoes, sweet bell peppers, chili peppers, eggplants, azaleas, and rhododendrons. While many bee species, including honeybees, are generalists who pollinate any flower with a nectar pollen reward, there are also specialists such as these uh, squash bees, which are well-adapted specialists. The hoary squash bee depends entirely on squash or pumpkins. They nest in the ground about 10 inches deep with the hole measuring up at the diameter of a pencil. If you'd like to attract specific native bees to your garden and landscape, as well as find out which plants are in bloom during which season to maintain a successive bloom, you can find these recipes in my favorite book, California Bees and Blooms by Gordon Frankie, Robin Troop, Roland Cavill, and Barbara Erder. And that will be in a, a source list at the very end of my presentation too. Then there are always the good, the bad, and the bugly. Here's a couple of good guys, but is it a bee or not a bee? Okay, you ready? So the first two, one, the first one is actually an orchard mason bee. And the second one is, all, is also a uh, long horned bee. Now remember that bees have two sets of wings equaling four wings, and their eyes are on the sides of their heads, and they usually have longer antennas. So you see the two on the right, their eyes are right there in front. Those are syrphid flies or flower or hover flies, and they actually have two wings. They have larger eyes in the front and shorter antenna, but they're both good pollinators. And here's a couple of the, some of the not so good guys for bees, as in art, some of these predators are subjective because they don't only get honeybees and, and solitary bees, but they can get some of the other bad guys. So just keep that in mind. So some of the predators are of the native bees are mites, just like the honeybee, uh, yellow jackets and hornets. Those guys will eat any insect they catch and chopping them into little bits and carrying them back to their nest. Then there are cuckoo bees. Uh, they come in many varieties. They are uh, nest stealers. So they lay their eggs in a nest built and inhabited by other solitary bees. And then the cuckoo bee larvae prey on the existing larva and provisions in the nest. Also birds, they're a predator to bees, but they're also pollinators. Then there are crab spiders. As you can see, they're right in the middle. That's a crab spider. Link spiders and orb weaving spiders, they also prey on some of the bad guys like aphids. So there you go. Uh, there's skunks that are diggers, which are not so good for the ground nesting bees. However, they eat snails. Okay. So here's some of the bugly guys. The assassin bug He's actually, I think the colors are brilliant, but uh, he actually injects venom and digestive juices into their victim. And it's, he's a voracious predator. That's the one on the left. The one on the right is a taconid fly. Uh, he parasitizes bees, ground beetles, caterpillars, earwigs, and grasshoppers. The adults feed on honeydew, pollen, and nectar, but they also pollinate. So if you build it, they will come. So here we are to the garden section. So native bees have uh, 150 100 traveling radius, which means they will be pollinating your garden compared to a honeybee, which actually averages a one mile to five mile radius. To support our pollinators, you can build a garden as large as you like or as small as a window box. Some of this is repetitive of what Gary just went over, so I'll go quickly. So you wanna start with a sunny location 
You want to select a variety of trees, shrubs, grasses, wild and ornamental flowers from a local source if possible in order of, to avoid transporting unwanted pests and pathogens to your garden. Uh, be sure to check your zone for the right plant in the right place. Overlap your bloom times from February to October, which is when the solitary native bees fly. They're out and about. Uh, the four foot patches is a good idea. And just like Gary said, one Ceanothus can cover that entire patch. Um, you wanna plant tallest for shortest, tallest to shortest in order to keep it easier for maintenance. Um, be sure to regularly deadhead your flowers and prune for uh, continuous flowering and healthy growth. Be and begin replacing the annuals halfway through the bloom season. So according to my favorite book, uh, California Birds and Blooms, quote, when a plant is halfway through flowering, native bees will begin to seek out new floral hosts, even if the first host still has available pollen and nectar, unquote. And again, native bees love native plants. Native bees, um, they pollinate, they visit about 75 to 150 flowers per day. A few examples in this picture are penstemon, starting in the left corner. Next to that, coreopsis, then salvia, California poppies, and a western redwood tree. A 2000 survey in Ber from Berkeley it, with 1,000 plus different plants, with 50 natives and 950 non native, almost 80% of the natives attracted bees, whereas about 8% of non natives did so, end quote. An added benefit, as Gary went over also to the native plants, is that once they're established in about one to three years, they require little, if any, fertilization, and many are drought tolerant. Uh, the UC Berkeley Bee Lab also has been working with farmers by creating plans for integrating native plants with their crops to draw the native turbo pollinators to their crops. Bees need both nectar and pollen to get what they need. So some plants produce one or the other, and some produce both. These are some examples of nectar plants that provide carbohydrates for their flight fuel. You can see them listed right there, the salvia, lavender. Everybody loves lavender, including me. I have a lot of that. And black honey sage. Here are some pollen plant examples. Some Ceanothus, that's a big star in the garden. California poppy, super easy to grow and they, they uh, replant themselves every year. And the globe mallow as well. The bees also like to take naps in there. Some more pollen and nectar plant examples. Here we go. These are pollen and nectar both. These are combo plants. These are would be my one of my first choices because they are double duty. They do pollen and nectar for all the pollinators. So on the left is the manzanita. And then the big winner right there in the middle is the common sunflower. Not only pollen and nectar, but seeds for the birds. And then the stems can be dried and used for cavity nesting bees. Very cool plant. And they're easy to grow and they don't take really great soil. You don't have to have great soil. You just put, you can direct sow them in your garden. You can even make structures out of them. They're a very good plant. Then the next would be the uh, Gil, uh, Gila capitala or the blue thimble flower. And then the cosmos, those are really uh, pretty and they're common too. And then one more. The bees love their Wheaties, the red buckwheat, red flower buckwheat. Uh, they're a nectar plant and is native actually to San Miguel, California. And it blooms in the summer. It's a good filler in flower beds and rock gardens. It can get very big as you saw in the other picture. Uh, the frequent flyers that visit are honeybees, leaf cutter bees, ultra green sweat bees and other pollinators. Make sure you provide the source of water and you wanna use some corks or uh, rocks that go above the water line because bees can't swim. So the 
female solitary native bee. She builds her nest and cares for her young. So the top left, you can see the leafcutter bee. She's getting a, a perfectly semicircular piece of a rose leaf, and she's using that to build her nest. So 30% of solitary native bees are cavity nesters like this, like you can see here in the little tubes. Three to four days after mating, the female begins nesting. So to preserve the species, she places the female eggs at the back of the nest and then the males in the front to emerge first, where they wait around the entrance for the females to mate with, multiple times without dying, by the way. She lays the egg, places a pollen ball made of a lot of pollen and a little nectar, then plant material or mud, if, she see, if she's a mason bee, then another egg, pollen ball, plant material, and so on. So then she seals the nest with the plant material mixed with saliva. She'll lay 30 to 40 eggs in her lifetime. The larvae feed for about 10 days, pupate inside the cell, and emerge full grown. The solitary native bees live approximately 40 days, almost six weeks. So a fun fact about the leafcutter bees, the females are usually, the mandibles of the females are usually broad at the tip with three to five teeth and specially designed area for cutting those leaf pieces, those perfectly semicircular leaf pieces out of your roses. Uh, support your local native bees by providing a nesting site in the morning sun with afternoon shade. The easiest way is to leave an undisturbed area of soil or a sand pile for 70% of the solitary bees that nest in the ground. Here's a fun fact. Female ground nesting bees, such as the digger bees, uh, they're equipped with knee pad-like vestibule plates used to brace against the walls of their tunnels while digging or delivering pr provisions. These guys just fascinate me. Anyway, um, also uh, note that bumblebees sometimes used abandoned second near gopher holes. They build small colonies and produce a small amount of honey for their young. Uh, next, uh, make a, you could make or buy an Airbnb for 30% of our cavity nesting solitary native bees. The best type of bee house is one that can be taken apart and cleaned each season. They are susceptible to pathogens and different things that can get in these tubes and uh, give them trouble and, and so on. You can bundle up to 15 to 20 paper mason bee tubes or dried hollowed out stems such as asters, or raspberries or sunflowers or a combination of them. You wanna cut at six to eight inch lengths and one end of the hollow stem must be closed. You wanna place the bundle in an open sided box with a one inch or more overhang for shade. To protect from birds, you can place a piece of chicken wire across the front and make it like kind of like a bubble over one end of the front that's the open end. You mount the box to a building or a stake three to six feet above the ground. Or you can use untreated block of wood and you can drill holes using a five sixteenths inch drill bit at three fourths inch apart. Drill five to eight inches deep. The depth is important. So holes less than one quarter inch should be three to four inches deep. Holes greater than one quarter inch should be five to eight inches deep with the back closed. If the tubular holes are larger than five sixteenths, the bees will not nest in them. You might get other things like spiders, but you won't get bees. Unless these blocks are lined with the nesting tubes for replacement, they will need to be completely replaced each year. A good source for nesting bee boxes, tubes, and supplies is crownbees.com or our favorite Amazon. Amazon also sells these things. Make sure they are for uh, solitary bees um, and be sure to use the nesting box with chambers or tubes that can be cleaned and replaced every one to two years. 
Okay. Most solitary bees do not return to their nest to sleep. You've probably seen the really cute pictures of the bees sleeping in flowers. It's, it really happens. I've actually photographed some sleeping in some flowers in my garden. Um, so some bees like the colettes or polyester bees also use tree resin from conifers and poplars. The resin is actually waterproof as well as a natural antimicrobial. The megachilidae, wool carter and leaf cutter bees, they use plant leaves, petals and fibers to build their nests. And the osmia or orchard mason bees, they need mud to build their nests. So a few examples of plants shown here are the roses for petals, like you saw in the earlier picture, uh, lamb's ears, which are a non-native in Celia californica, uh, raspberry, elderberry, and sunflower stems, uh, conifers and poplars, trees, even dead trees with beetle made holes. I have some uh, old logs in my property that have beetle holes and the bees actually do nest in there. So you also want to protect our bees and pollinators. You want to protect, you can protect the from the bird predators with the wire mesh over the bee nest tubes, as you can see in the picture on the left. Make sure the wire protrudes a bit from the opening and not stretch taut across the front. Always, always read the label, read the label and read the label of anything you use in your garden to take necessary precaution to keep yourself safe as well as the pollinators. And here is a list of my sources and resources. I really had a good time researching this and making this presentation. And next up is Peggy Burhan about butterflies. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen now. Whoops, where to go? Sorry, it's just all these windows. <laughs> While Peggy's getting going, I just wanted to point out, and I hope I'm not embarrassing anyone, we have our featured Book of the Year author, Meredith May has joined us. So she's uh, avidly listening in to your presentation. Thanks, Meredith. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, I... so, I'm glad you, so glad you could join us. Uh, this is so lovely and I'm learning so much because I, I know a lot about honeybees, but not the uh, solitary bees. So I just learned that my bee hotel is in the wrong place. So thank you. I'm going <laughs> to oh move. My gosh. And we'll, we're recording this and we'll send out, um, you know, this when it's done in a couple of days. So yeah, we'll send it to your email. Thanks, Meredith. Yeah, so hi, um, as Karen mentioned, my name is Peggy Burhan. I'm also a master gardener. My focus at the master gardener is on native plants and I uh, chair the native garden in our demo garden. Um, I am also a California naturalist and a docent at the Pismo Beach Monarch Grove. So I do have a bit of a background in um, butterflies, uh, but I also grow a lot of food things <laughs> in my um, garden and I work on a, a Royal Grande helpline too as a master gardener. So we're going to talk a little bit about Lepidoptera as pollinators, which are the butterflies and the moths. And obviously we can't talk about all of them because there are 160,000 plus different butterflies and moths. Um, the monarchs get a lot of publicity because they're uh, very visible and they have been um, experiencing a significant decline, uh, as uh, almost everyone probably on this call is aware of. Uh, but there are a lot of other butterflies and moths, about 19% in the U.S., that are at, also at risk for extinction. And this has a lot to do with habitat loss, climate change. You know, we've been talking about use of pesticides but also the um, disease that comes in um, on some of these um, non-native plants as well. 
and the fact that our habitat is being used for other things such as grazing you know we typically uh, weeds that butterflies like grow along roadsides and we like to make roadsides look pretty so uh, sometimes we lose just the things we need um, while we're farming or creating new habitat for people so we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we move forward um, but let me make my disclaimer that, you know, Karen's bees are really the mainstay of pollination. And although butterflies uh, do pollinate, they are not the primary pollinators in your garden, but they're the ones you see the most. You looked at a lot of those bees that Karen showed you and you probably thought, wow, I never saw that. You know, um, they're really small sometimes. Uh, you might think they're flies. Um, so we see the butterflies and if we can help the butterflies and bring the butterflies to your yard, you're probably going to also be bringing all of these native bees as well. So the butterflies and moths, they pollinate in a similar way to the bees. You know, they land on the butterfly and get the, I'm sorry, the butterfly lands on the flower and gets the nectar. And then they're picking up pollen then on their legs and their body. And then they go to that next flower. And of course, that's how the pollination happens. Um, they also sometimes have this symbiotic or mutually beneficial relationship where the proboscis of the butterfly maybe fits perfectly into a, one of these flowers and um, helps with pollination while they're getting the nectar. So lots of things happening that are similar. And if we want to attract butterflies to our garden, we really have to think about the whole life cycle of the butterfly. So as you probably know from third grade, <laughs> the butterfly lays an egg, becomes a caterpillar, forms some type of chrysalis, and then emerges as another adult. So when we think about this, thinking about how do we support uh, not only the plants that the butterfly needs to lay her eggs on, um, and then the caterpillar needs to eat as well, but then also what does the butterfly need to nectar on? So caterpillars eat plants, that's what they're typically called the food plants and winged adults um, need nectar. So the Xerces Society, which I will refer to as a lot of our resources, that Xerces Society with their website down here, which I think I put in the chat box earlier, um, they're a organization that conserves invertebrates. And one of their quotes that's really important for what we're talking about today is that growing the right flowers, shrubs and trees with overlapping bloom times, which Gary talked about as well, is the single most effective course of action to support pollinators throughout the year. And it says from spring through fall, but for those of us in uh, California, really we have blooming all year long. So it's really trying to find plants that bloom uh, to help our pollinators all year long. So butterflies like things similar to what we talked about, bees. They like plants of varying heights so they can move around in the garden. Um, they also like a diversity of plants. We still wanna conform to what Gary talked about in having plots of maybe three by three or four by four, you know, grouping some plants together so they can um, get more efficient pollination, but also having some diversity so that you can attract a lot of different um, butterflies to your garden. And they like sun. Uh, butterflies typically can't fly unless it's about 50 to 55 degrees and you'll see them out on the plants sunning themselves to try to get that warm energy to allow them to fly. Uh, they also like protection from the wind, um, you know, so maybe having some taller trees nearby where they can go and seek protection on a very windy day. And then as we talked about the puddling, they like a water bath, some type of water in the garden area to allow them to uh, drink water as well. And as um, you saw, just a very shallow um, with some rocks or something in the basin to um, facilitate that because they also don't swim. <laughs> they don't take a bird bath like, like the, bird bath, the birds do in your garden. So everyone can plant nectar flowers uh, to help the butterflies. Um, we got to feed our hungry butterflies by providing this sugary nectar. And we in the central coast of California, I'll talk a little bit about the monarch butterfly, but the um, monarch butterfly comes here in the winter for us. And when you think about a butterfly coming here in November, December, January, a lot of our cultivars and plants, um, they're not in bloom in some of those months. So to Gary's point about taking an inventory, 
it's really good to think about like walk around your neighborhood and say, what's in bloom in January or looking at the nurseries, what's in bloom that I could plant to help the butterflies that are looking for food um, at this time. Um, the list that the Xerces Society provides, I put a list on there that's specifically for monarch nectar plants, but a lot of butterflies will nectar on those plants as well, even on non monarchs. So some of the cultivars that butterflies really like. I've put a list here of a few. Lantana is one. Um, I have lantana in my yard. Even though I'm the native plant person, I want to let you know that uh, I have a mix. You know, it's good to have some cultivars along with your natives. And I have lantana, and the lantana is in bloom all year long. There's at least some blooms on it throughout the year. So that's a good plant. Uh, bee balm and coneflower also, black-eyed Susan, things that are kind of in the daisy and sunflower family they really like. So I list a few um, things there that also are in that family that you might want to uh, plant in your yard. And then um, not the native plants, uh, we've already talked a little bit about manzanita. Manzanita is in bloom in January and February in my yard. And many of the manzanitas have different bloom times. So not all of them are blooming. And same with the Ceanothus. Um, some will bloom at different times. Fleabane is a native daisy. Yarrow is very attractive to butterflies. Hummingbird sage is just now starting to bloom. If you have that in your yard, it's just coming out now. Uh, native thistles will be more in the summer. Um, and then we mentioned Ceanothus. Uh, Karen showed you a picture of that and also of some buckwheat. Uh, they will nectar on the milkweed flowers. Um, and when the coyote brush and the mule fat is in bloom, uh, those two also can provide good sources of nectar. Again, we wanna try to decrease our use of insecticides because unfortunately, if you're killing the bad insects, you're also killing the good insects. So the butterflies and the caterpillars are insects too. Um, we do have master gardener classes, usually about controlling pests um, and about using IPM, which is integrated pest management, where we really try to focus on the least, um, uh, detrimental, if you will, uh, way of getting rid of pests and using insecticides only in, in very rare cases. Um, we also, we have a helpline uh, in the county where you can call with your questions too. So if you're um, looking for ideas um, to get rid of pests. Um, now the caterpillar, we call this the food plant, whatever the caterpillar eats. And the butterfly will lay eggs normally right on that plant that the caterpillar wants to eat. And here's the good news, bad news, that caterpillar is going to eat your plant. So we do sometimes have people call in and say, oh, the caterpillar ate everything. And now, you know, my, my plant is bare. Uh, the good news is that these are normally perennials. And uh, at least in this case with the monarch butterfly, there's a picture of a monarch caterpillar there on some milkweed. Um, the leaves will grow back. So, uh, and it's fun to watch. Um, if you want to know, you want to attract other butterflies besides um, monarchs, because we all kind of know about milkweed and monarchs, there's a book that I use, I'm gonna hold it up, but it's also in our references, the Southern California Butterflies. Um, and even though it's the Southern California, a lot of these butterflies are in our, our area as well. And if you see a butterfly that you want to attract to your garden, um, in fact, um, I'm going to try to attract some fritillaries to my garden, and it will tell you what the food plant is, as well as the nectar plant. And for the example of Gulf fritillaries, they like passion vine. So um, I'm going to try to get some passion vine growing in my yard to see if I can attract them. But here's some other non-natives that attract um, butterflies, the cassia, sweet fennel, snapdragons even, and then natives. Um, even oaks and willows will attract um, some of our native butterflies like the Loquins Admiral and the California Sister Butterfly. So lots of other fun things, other fun butterflies you can attack, attract to your yard. So usually um, because of my role with the monarch butterflies, a lot of people ask me about the monarchs and what they can do. So I thought I'd address that in just a couple slides about milkweed and um, the recommendation is if you live um, away from where they overwinter, it's okay to plant milkweed. And of course, everyone can plant nectar plants to attract um, the butterflies. 
And the thinking about planting the milkweed, so the butterflies overwinter near the coast of California and the Xerces Society's um, opinion on this is that if the milkweed is too close to where they overwinter, it causes them to break their life cycle. And this part of their cycle is called diapause, where they sort of pause their reproduction while they're overwintering. And if they sense milkweed in the area and we get a warm day, they may say, well, maybe winter's over. I should go um, you know, lay eggs instead of staying here for the winter. So that's part of the reasoning of not um, planting a milkweed too close to the coast. And then we also recommend that you plant native milkweed if you're gonna plant milkweed. And here's four examples. I have some pictures on some other slides coming up. And the, the difference between the native milkweed and the non-native, the non-native is also called tropical or Asclepius carasavica. And it harbors a parasite called Ophryrosis electrospheria, which is referred to commonly as OE because that's not easy to say. <laughs> um, and what happens is the OE is very uh, damaging to the butterflies and they will come out of their chrysalis deformed in many cases, or they won't live long enough to um, lay eggs and reproduce. So the recommendation is to really take it out and um, plant native milkweed, or if you can't take it out to cut it back to the ground uh, in the fall so that that, and throw out those stems so that the parasite you know, will be lessened. It's been referred to as a super spreader event for monarch butterflies um, because this is so commonly sold at many of the big box stores because look how beautiful it is. It's a beautiful flower, very easy to grow and the caterpillars love it. I um, compare it to um, feeding your children Snickers bars instead of any other food. Um, they would love to eat that, <laughs> but they probably won't be very healthy um, going forward. So um, anything you can do to help the monarchs, that would be one thing uh, not to plant the tropical milkweed. So here's some of our local milkweeds that do really well here. The narrow leaf milkweed on the left with the uh, white flowers and the um, showy milkweed with the pink flowers. It has a broader leaf, the, the butterflies like these. Uh, these two are earlier bloomers uh, or emerge, they emerge from the ground earlier because they all, all these milkweeds that are native, they die back in the winter and then they emerge in the spring. So um, the Asclepias areocarpa or the woolly pod milkweed and the Asclepias californica or the California milkweed are um, early emergers. And then of course, this is examples, two examples of the non-native um, milkweed that we wanna encourage people to not plant. So um, normally we have a fourth member of our pollinator team, Norm Smith, he's our um, entomologist. And he usually joins us to talk a little bit about some of the non-bee and butterfly. So I'm gonna share some of his slides, but please know that I am not an entomologist. <laughs> so if there's detailed questions, I'll have to get back to you um, on some of these. Um, but here are some things you might see in your garden like lace wings. And sometimes people even buy lace wings to uh, eat aphids. So these are pollinators also in our garden. Um, Karen talked a little about, about the surfid fly. So um, I won't mention that in too much detail to show that it does kind of look like a bee, right? And it is an active pollinator. And there's another example. And then the tachinid fly also looks a little bit like just a house fly, but you see all these very bristly hairs, which will attract uh, pollen and make them an effective pollinator. This thread-waisted wasp, you know, we got to take the good with the bad. Unfortunately, some of these wasps, and like we mentioned, yellow jackets and things like that, they will eat the caterpillars that maybe we're trying to um, get the butterflies to um, emerge from. Um, but they're also uh, pollinators as well as they land on um, flowers and take the nectar and then share the pollen. Same with this mud dabber wasp too, effective pollinator. Uh, the crebernine wasp um, also predates on um, caterpillars. And you see, you know, to a lot of us, it looks kind of like a bee, um, but there's many of these in our garden. And here's a small wasp also that is a pollinator, but this guy is great to have around because he will eat the aphids on your plants too and pollinate. So we want to try to encourage them um, in our gardens. Uh, a, uh, these um, tarantula hawks 
are also pollen feeders. So they're um, grabbing some pollen on their legs and passing it along to the next flower as well. And um, only an entomologist would call these uh, handsome. <laughs> this spider wasp, uh, Norm calls him handsome um, and has a powerful sting. So we do wanna stay away uh, from handling them, of course. Um, this is the, um, the scoliad wasp and the yellow jacket, as you might be familiar with that. Um, we have a California species of paper wasp as well and some other predatory um, wasps that are really, really small. And here's a, a wasp attacking a spider. So, you know, it's kind of a dog eat dog world here, but unfortunately this is one that I uh, had in my garden where now here's a spider eating one of these um, megachiliad bees, which is one of the pollinators that Karen talked about. Um, so uh, it, you know, everybody has a, a predator and a prey in this environment. It all goes around. And then just to add some additional photos of some flowers that might help you with attracting pollinators um, is the buckwheats, which we have a few different species here. The ceanothus, which Karen showed you some examples of that as well. In my garden, I plant mint and rosemary and they are covered with all kinds of bees. Um, so adding a little bit of herbs to your garden that attract the, the bees as well would be helpful to you. Um, here's some yarrows, uh, both yellow and white that can uh, attract pollinators and butterflies. And the toyon, sometimes called Christmas berry, um, is in bloom um, later in the year and has um, in the summer and then um, also attracts a lot of the pollinators. This is a very um, nondescript bush that you might not think of as a um, attracting to pollinators. Uh, this is actually in Norm's yard and he says it has a very teeny little flower, uh, but that is covered and it's a very nondescript flower uh, covered with pollinators um, when it's in bloom. So even some things that you might not um, think of. And then here's a Palo Verde uh, tree as well that uh, if you get that to grow in your area, has a lot of pollinators too. So a um, couple more slides just as a, a closing slide and then I'm gonna show you the references and, and resources. Um, these are kind of some of the key points that we made um, for take home messages for you, you know, selecting diverse flowers, overlapping bloom times, including those native plants, trying to get those single flowers, you know, don't forget the trees because they have uh, flowers as well and extend your bloom time by deadheading. Leave that bare ground, as Karen mentioned, for those nesting ground bees and um, grow those flowers in patches and avoiding, of course, any insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides uh, that can be harming our pollinators as well. And here's some of our other resources. So I think um, I'll close the formal presentation and look forward to some of the questions. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Peggy, there was one posted question. If you could clarify on three to five miles from the coast for milkweed. Oh, sorry, five miles from the coast. Yes, thank you. That's kind of arbitrary. It's five miles from overwintering sites and some of the overwintering sites might not be exactly on the coast, but for the most part, most of the monarch overwintering sites uh, do tend to be very close to the coast. Thank you. Okay, you guys, wow, so much information to take in. Um, we do have about four or five questions that we've been gathering in the chat. Shall I go ahead and throw those out to our presenters? Sure. And if, if those have already been answered, maybe just let us know. Um, I think Ellen asked about, were the little boxes up high in the demonstration garden for bats? Uh, yeah, we pointed out that it, it was a combination of bird houses, bat houses, and perches, um, yes, there, there were more than just bat houses up there. Yeah. Okay, cool. Ellen has a great garden, I've been there. Um, Colby wants to know, does the bush log pile need to be in the sun? Uh, yeah, we and I posted on that, they actually should be in more of a dappled shade. Uh, they, they can be in the sun, but in a partial shade would be better. Okay. 
Uh, Teresa wants to know, are all of the types of bees mentioned on the Central Coast? And I think that was for Karen's presentation, if I'm not mistaken. Most of the bees I mentioned are on the Central Coast. Yes. Okay, so it's a yes. Um, Judy asked, what is the suggested length the bamboo should be cut for the bee houses? And should one end remain sealed? The length should be five to eight inches. And it does need to be closed at one end. And when you put it in the box, make sure it's there's about a one inch overhang for a little bit of um, shade. Okay, great. Um, I think we answered the question from William about where can you get native milkweeds? I think Gary, did you? Yes, I put some up there. That's not a, a completely exclusive list, but just some that carry the native milkweed. Normally we sell it at the demonstration garden, but again, due to COVID, unfortunately we don't have the plant sales, so. So did you mention earlier on when the demonstration garden might be open again to the public? We have no idea. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. I know my um, good friend, Julie Smith, is one of your gardeners. And she oh, said, yeah. I know she's been doing some work, but she said, no, we're not open yet. So yeah, and we are plant, we are trying to propagate some of those lesser known um, milkweeds. I should have mentioned that the showy milkweed and the narrow leaf milkweed are usually pretty easy to find. Um, especially the narrow leaf, um, but some of the others, the Areocarpa and the Californica, we're trying to propagate those um, pretty successfully in our demonstration garden. So when we do start to have plant sales, look for that. We should um, be okay. having some native milkweed there. And there are some other native uh, plant uh, growers in the area that um, Growing Grounds sometimes has uh, milkweed, mm -hmm. Las Palitas, um, and a great source is to go for all native plants is to go to calscape.org. That's C A L S C A P E.org. And if you put in the native plant that you're looking for, it will list nurseries that carry it. And then you can click on that link. And, you know, maybe they don't all have it right when you want it, but it'll at least give you a place to start to see where um, native plants are um, uh, available. Um, also, slow botanical. I'm Slo sorry. Slow Botanical Gardens is having their uh, spring sale right now. Uh, go to their website. You can purchase online. And then I think it's next week we go and pick up the purchases. Uh, but they're slowly opening to the public. So Slow Botanical Garden. You don't have to be a member either. Oh, great. Thanks for adding that. And Peggy, can you give us that um, Cal State one again? I'll type that into the uh, chat. It's... Um uh, Calscape, C -A uh, yeah, C -A -L -S -C -A -P -E dot oh, Calscape, okay, Cal I was thinking. Yeah, okay. Calscape. Okay. Let's see, I think there was one more question. A friend has a milkweed called Jewels, I think, with globe-shaped seed pods. Are they okay to use? This is from Teresa. Yeah, you know, I would have to look that up. I'm familiar with those um, in other parts of, they're called glomulus, I think. Um, and I'd have to look that up to be sure. I'm not, I'm not familiar with it enough to, to comment. Okay. But if you send me your email, I can take a look for that. Yeah, so you can uh, go ahead and put your email in the chat there and we can get that question to Peggy. Any last questions? I know we've gone over your time a little bit, but hopefully all this good information is, is worth it. Um, any last questions? And then I, I wanna do a couple things since we're lucky enough to have Meredith here, our, our book of the year author, author of The Honey Bus. Uh, I wanna just give her a minute to say hi. But before we do that, I'm just gonna do a little quick screen share and repeat some of the uh, web addresses that, um, may be helpful to you. So Peggy, can you stop screen sharing? Oh, yes, I can. Yeah, great. Okay, and I'll go ahead and do mine. Okay, and I've just got some um, 
reminders of some of the different web pages that can help you find out more information on Cuesta's Book of the Year events. If you go to this main events page, it will really be the best jumping off point for any of the other events that we have coming up this week and of course the main author event next week. You do need to sign up for most of the events and that would be here. If you're feeling generous and want to donate to our program so we can bring another author to, author to campus, hopefully in person next year, you can go here. And then we did, do have our virtual book club tomorrow and there's no sign up required for that. Just go straight to that Zoom room. So take a picture uh, of your um, with your camera of this uh, page and I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to, I want to say thank you to everybody for being here, for participating. Our presenters have been great. I'm just a container gardener kind of person, but I've learned a lot, mostly what I don't already know. Thanks to our book of the year committee as well. And then I wanted to give Meredith a chance if she wanted to say hi or anything else. Um, Meredith, are you okay with that? Hi, I'm, I'm very okay with that. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, okay. I'm really looking forward to talking with everybody next week. Next week? Yeah, right? Yeah, it's a week from Friday. <laughs> and you know, I want to tell people, if you haven't already signed up for Meredith's uh, presentation on Friday, April 23rd from 5 to 7, that will be at one of the websites that I just listed there. If you go there right now, it's gonna say sold out, but we're working on something today as we speak. And hopefully tonight when you go in, there'll be another hundred tickets up there. Again, free, we just need you to sign in and get your, your ticket. So we're working on that as we speak. <laughs> well, that is that is really good news. Um, you know, I, we uh, are just so blessed to have Zoom. I mean, and I really appreciate you know, the book of the year and just sticking with it. I know we've, we've moved the date three and four and five times. And, um, you know, I, I'm just amazed that um, people are reading this book and responding to it. And I'm, I'm having a blast, you know, the, I think the best thing about this book is, um, you know, I used to think I, re I really would want to publish my memoir that was my biggest goal but actually it's preserving my grandfather and um sharing him with the world in perpetuity and so i um have put together a slideshow that has a lot of photos that aren't in the book so it's really going to be fun it's like a um, vip tour you're going to get to go into the honey bus and um the presentation at the end has a short video of my grandfather. So you will be able to hear him and see him. And it's the only video that exists of him. Oh, wow. That's so it's really, yeah, it's really special. Um, and you'll get to see if he matches the image you had in your head when yeah. you read the book. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's so cool. All right. Well, listen, guys, it's been great spending time with you this afternoon. And again, thanks so much to Meredith for popping in. We didn't know she was coming. And for Gary, Karen, and Peggy, and all the other gardeners out there. And for those of you that came, came in today. And again, if you want to get the recording, please email me and I will make a list of uh, email addresses. And again, I'll put my uh, address in there, email directly there, and we'll see that you get the recording of today's presentation. It takes a couple days for it to come through, but we will have that for you. All righty, did I leave anybody out? All of our wonderful gardeners? All right, we're gonna say goodbye and hope to hopefully see you tomorrow or Friday or next Friday at one of our other events. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. Right, thanks. Thanks, Peggy, Karen, everybody. Thank you. Uh-huh, bye-bye now.